If you're a faithful listener, we have a favor to ask. Go to somebody who's not part of the normal crowd, your church family, your your normal nerd people you hang out with or whatever. Go to some somebody who really needs to hear Christianity of this sort, at this level, in these dimensions, and introduce them to the podcast. Take a chance on it. Because uh, our goal is not just to reach a few friends and uh, remember past school years, but to actually be a cultural wedge, however tiny, in a world at a very crucial time. So we ask you to help us out. Thank you very much. Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. And so today we are continuing our conversation from last week about Noah. So last week we talked about how Noah saw the end of the world as he knew it. And today we're going to talk more about how Noah came out of the ark after the waters receded and had to build a new civilization from what he had. And there's a lot that the Bible doesn't tell us about what Noah had. Uh, We have to sort of read between the lines, and the Bible assumes that we're not dumb sometimes to some extent. I always find it interesting that the Bible doesn't say that God lined up the animals two by two so that they would go into the ark in a neat line, although that's how we always see the story playing out in in the nurseries with the toys, right? We have the two giraffes followed by the two hippos followed by the two cats. And that's not at all what the Bible said. God told Noah of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come into thee to keep them alive. So Noah had to level up in animal handling um, (laughs) and find all of these animals, bring them to the ark to bring them in. What else could Noah do? He could build a ship. Yeah. Did he have the practical guide to shipbuilding? (laughs) He built a ship half the size of the Queen Mary. And creation scientists have argued for a long time as to whether or not he built it on dry land or in some ocean or something but i think it it it, we we have two possibilities the world had never seen such a thing the world saw them all the time either way either noah was a genius and a uh, innovator on the order of uh, a thomas edison or the world was used to getting around in huge boats powered by something In any case, the point is that, as you said, the Bible doesn't tell us about all kinds of things that, in retrospect, we we would dearly like to know about because we're often more curious about details than we are about the fate of our souls. But here was somebody who was not a caveman, who's not an idiot. Uh, He came out of a world that had mastered metallurgy by the seventh generation and still had time left and people living to nearly a thousand years what was that world like and when noah went into the ark and here's a here's a question that's always fun to ask people if you were going on the ark what would you take with you to use in your new world and uh, well let me throw it back at you people what would you take with you if it were our world what would you take with you on this ark whether it be a boat or a starship or whatever or what do you think most people would take Mm -hmm. Basics of blacksmithing. Mm. <laughs> Some instruction Thoughtful. manuals. Instruction manuals. Yeah, the dangerous see, book for boys. <laughs> that, that has some practical use. The, the The thing is that most people don't think in those terms, and they they often go to oh, my, my laptop, my Ferrari, my you know whatever generation i have to be living in whatever my cell phone yeah that's gonna do a lot of good <laughs> when all the cell new... towers are destroyed <laughs> yeah. there's no more internet i know my own students over the years have asked well why didn't he take this or that and and it's often about on that level uh what would he do with it exactly how about a four-wheeler okay four-wheeler how long is the gas gonna last 
Well, it's solar powered. All right. When's it going to wear out? And where are the replacement parts coming from? I, I think you were both much more on the on the nose when you talked about practical blacksmithing and uh, handling dangerous physical situations. That, that's an obvious thing for Noah to have taken. He did have quite a bit of room, and he could, he could take a lot of things. He could take uh, technological artifacts, but books, information, especially about the basics of building a civilization, that would be useful. But since Noah was, above all, a prophet, a prophet of the covenant, the most important thing he would take would be the word of God. And at this point, the Bible, such as it was, existed in three phases— the book of the generations of the heavens and the earth, the creation account, Genesis 1 and a couple verses into the next chapter, and the book of Adam, uh, which goes from there up until Noah's time and the Noah's brief history of the world before the flood, later to be added to by his sons and more particularly again by Shem. So there was already one writing, despite the claims of some well-intentioned Christians, and there were prophetic histories of what was important to God and if God wanted us to know if they had electric light bulbs or starships, he would have told us. Mm. It's obviously not important to the overall drama of civilization or of the covenant of redemption, of grace. But what is important is that Noah, the one thing we absolutely know that Noah brought, aside from animals, is the book because we still have it afterwards. <laughs> and it's added to. So we we can think in terms of yeah, the, the tech manuals, engineering guides, practical blacksmithing, dangerous, what, what's it called? The book? The dangerous, dangerous book, book for boys. Dangerous book for boys. Yeah, I have girl children, so I wasn't quite sure of the title. Yeah, well, there's another one for girls called The Daring Book for Girls, but I had That's it and it book. wasn't as good. Yeah, well, it was. And I remember that there were some, here's how to tell people's fortunes with cards. So I don't think I <laughs> ever got that one. So, yeah, practical things, but Noah's concern would have been the gospel, the covenant promise. And that's what he would want his descendants to treasure and to learn and to master and to pass on. And obviously, they didn't very well. Because when we look at the post diluvian world, we see civilization springing up very quickly. Tigris Euphrates, the Nile River Valley, the Yellow River, the Indus River Valley, some things that now are underwater that archaeologists keep coming upon. Um, they could build huge walls and pyramids and ziggurats. They could they could do sanitation. The Indus River civilization is creepy, where all of the houses are exactly the same size and shape and oriented the same way. It's like something out of a wrinkle in time. Uh, where everything is uniform and nothing, no expression, no private expression allowed. But they could do all things. Or housing development. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so yeah, no one would have been really disappointed. And he lived a long time after the flood as a Chem. And they would have seen all of this with horror and regret and wondered, did I do something wrong or, or what? And yet the word of God survived. You all, being being the nerds that we are, you may all remember an episode of the original Star Trek called The Piece of the Action. Uh, I don't. The, you don't? Well, Just let me tell clarify. you about it, Emily. Yeah, please refresh crew, my memory. The crew of the Enterprise comes upon a planet that was visited a couple hundred years earlier by a previous Federation starship. And uh, it, it, that ship came before the Prime Directive went into effect. So they freely discussed their past, their culture, their technology, and left behind a book on the gangs of Chicago. <laughs> and this planet said, ooh, the book, and decided that this is how civilization should develop. And they began to recreate their society in the image of Chicago in the 20s. <laughs> Gangsters, malls, syndicates, Machine guns. Prohibition. Prohibi the whole thing. And the the interesting thing from our point of view, is aside from the fact that a book can shape a culture, is that Dr. McCoy, when he sees the book and understands what's going on, let's see, what's the, what's the quote exactly? McCoy and Spock are talking. Spock says, they evidently seized upon that one book as the blueprint for an entire society. And McCoy says, as the Bible. Mm. <laughs> 
Uh, that was the 1960s, and Gene Roddenberry was anything but a Christian. Yeah. But whoever wrote that original script, and I forget who it was, at least there was still this idea that books can shape, form, create cultures, and that the Bible is the obvious example of a book that has done that in the past, so that any book that would do that is, in a sense, the Bible for that age and for that world. And I, I like your thoughts. Do you think that today, at the, the dawn of the 21st century, Christians actually think of the Bible in those terms? What say you? I think we it see depends. something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it does depend on what you mean. Even today, we see different, you know, cookbooks or technical books that call themselves the Bible of crockpots, the Bible of these different subjects, which, well, I think it's terribly irreverent, but it does show that the Bible is supposed to be authoritative in some sense. But then again, I do think I've seen that trend dying out as I've gotten older. Brian, what were you going to say? Oh, just that it, it really depends on which cross-section of professing Christianity you look at. Because obviously in the the reformed sects, uh, sects is the wrong word, you know what I mean? Sections, denominations, uh, tradition. We, at the very least, have a very strong stated belief in the sufficiency of the Bible as the authoritative book for Christian life and for uh, human morality. But if you look at denominations that have embraced liberalism, such as the, the PCUSA, the ELCA, depending on, even in there, depending on which one you look at, they may have a stated statement of the sufficiency of scripture, but it clearly is not lived out. And if you look at other traditions where uh, tradition plays a almost primary role in comparison to the scripture, such as um, Roman Catholicism, at least in practice, it really depends on on which aspect of public Christendom you're you're talking about, and we should hope that this would be at least one of the measuring standards for what determines the bounds of Christendom in the first place. But not always, uh, not always the case. And I think if we turn away from Christendom to culture at large there's this distancing from the heritage of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Uh, you know, it's much more likely to for someone to identify with the indigenous peoples or some other thing and say, look at how these people who had the Bible came in and oppressed everyone. Mm. I think that's much more the narrative you hear in the world today. And as a very brief side note, I do always find it humorous that uh, Christianity is lauded as the white man's religion when G Jesus was Jewish and <laughs> the church for the first 300 years was Mediterranean and Israeli African. And, and African Ethiopian. and Ethiopian and spread in further east into <laughs> you know the, the Arabic peoples, uh, what they are now. I've always found that humorous. <laughs> So we're looking at a one question getting split in, into a number, all good questions. Let's, uh, well, let, let's focus on American Christianity since that's what we know best. Uh, I think there are those traditions where, you know, Brian, you said the, the, the Bible is authoritative for Christian living or something to that effect. The question then becomes, well, Christian living in what spheres or dimensions of life? You're talking about personal relations with your family and friends, maybe as an employee, employer. Are you talking about the wider world of civil government, of culture, art, science? Has the American church of whatever stripe or color or flavor really continued to insist that the Bible speaks to these things? Uh, even in our own Reformed Presbyterian traditions, we, we give lip service to this, but is it, it isn't it true that far too often if we try to say to congress the supreme court let's say the lord we get told by people with theological degrees um you can't make that appeal you need to you need to you need to come at it from the angle of natural law 
Is that your experience or am I overreacting here? I think a lot of times I see people revert to natural law because it's much easier to make the argument and find common ground and move forward. I personally see some superficiality there, (laughs) as you might expect. But yeah, I think the reversion is always to natural law and trying to find common ground that may or may not exist. As we talked about before, there ain't no neutral ground. True. Um, one of the things that I've I've noticed, at the very least, is in, in the Reformed Presbyterian tradition, of which I'm a part, the Westminster Divines, for instance, spoke very highly of natural law. And it, it fed into their uh, determinations of the, the general equity of the Mosaic Law, for instance. And they, you know, Calvin, Calvin even, I would say, leaned a little heavy on Aquinas' writings to a certain extent. That doesn't necessarily mean like what what Van Til calls it the um what does he call it common ground is it just common ground in his uh, writing point or? of contact point of contact for him points of contact it doesn't mean that they don't actually have those points of contact they right. they can absolutely yeah. recognize the the validity of things based on a natural law where, where the disconnect is is in their philosophical underpinning of why they hold to that. Mm-hmm. And that's why I don't like the term noble pagan because, <laughs> well, obviously there, there is no They're such thing. They're in the thing. outer circles but, of hell, right? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Let's listen to Dante on this one. But you, you do get people who, even, even though they are reprobate, you know, from an, from an eternal standpoint, and we don't know that for sure because we can't, have elect vision. Um, <laughs> Electo vision. <laughs> Electo goggles, new from Wemco. 2.0. We don't have those. And even, even the reprobate can still recognize things, even if they don't have the necessary philosophy to justify it consistently, which we would recognize and state is only the property of the Christian religion. We're the only ones that have a truly consistent basis for living. But whether they hold to it consistently or not, they can still recognize it. And I might be overstepping it a little bit here to say it this way, but it, it's, in my experience, and as far as I can tell from the scripture, that is one expression of the statement, the law is written upon their hearts. Mm-hmm. They, they, they can recognize it. And right now we seem to be in a downturn where they're even rejecting that, which is really sad to see. But I also think that we should point where those things are still intact in people. We should seize on that as a gospel exposition moment Mm -hmm. and opportunity that the Lord himself has given us. Yeah. Paul even says when, when he uses that line that you just quoted, that the law is written on their hearts in Romans 1 and 2, it's there and they see it and it condemns them. Yes. Let me throw in a couple things here. First of all, what Paul actually says is the work of the law, the, the effect mm. of the law, not mm. that not that the law in its totality is there because that's the whole point. Well, not the whole point, but one of the central points of the gospel, the new covenant, as it's described in Jeremiah and in Hebrews, is that the Holy Spirit writes his law cleanly, freshly mm. upon our hearts. Mm-hmm. But insofar as, yes, there is this this sense echoed in conscience, that Paul comes at it another way in Romans 2 of saying, if you make a moral judgment, you condemn yourself, because the moment you say that's wrong, you've admitted there's a right and wrong, and you know you've broken your own conscience, your own standards, so you are guilty. Traditionally, this has been referred to in, in Reformed theology, not as natural law, but as natural revelation or general revelation. Mm-hmm natural law tends to be more of a uh, well something rooted in stoicism and then on through aquinas and such where there is something abstract in the universe itself and in the mind and logic of man that we can access without scripture and that is just as accurate than scripture and as you suggested more commonly appreciated so that we can leave the bible behind i know that none of us plan on that and that's sort of the point of all these questions, because Brian said, yeah, that's not working so well anymore. People, Mm -hmm. things that in my generation were unheard of in on moral terms 
I barely, when I was growing up, I barely knew what homosexuality was. I knew it from the Bible, but you didn't see it portrayed nightly on television programs or Netflix. Abortion on demand was just becoming a thing. Death penalty was still operative for murderers. I've lived through a rapidly changing world. And the appeal of, but no, that's wrong, is finding less and less resonance as our culture degenerates. And so back to the, at least the intent of my question, have, have we as Christians just kind of thrown up our hands and said, well, we have the Bible for ourselves, for our families, for our churches, and for basic simple things, but it obviously has failed our broader culture because no one listens. So if we're going to interact with the culture, we have to go play on their turf, on their grounds, and maybe we'll do some good, maybe not. Uh, are we equipping the next generation of Christians to interact with the culture based on scripture rather than on something else? And this is, this is and we look back at Noah. Noah wanted his, his descendants to believe the Bible, such as they had it, and they didn't. And we got Babel instead. And uh, just to drive home something that came to mind as you were describing that, the general downturn that we're seeing in the West, at the very least, isn't anything new. This all happened in Rome mm -hmm. and in Greece. Yep. And all of this has happened before and all of it will happen again. <laughs> but rejecting the cyclical view of time. Uh, <laughs> It's not anything new. It's something the church has addressed before mm -hmm. and been quite successful in addressing. And that should give us at least a little bit of optimism. And that sort of brings me to my next question for you. The uh, This uh, strange new planet in Star Trek fastened on the gangs of Chicago as <laughs> their Bible. Well, as Christians, we would hope that the Bible is what we take to be the guide for all of life, for all of culture, for all of society. But if we believe that, and if reading and writing are so important because the Bible's a book that we have to read, then probably someplace along the line, we should produce secondary books in the light of that, fallible human books written by sinners, not inspired, but that nonetheless reflect in some measure the worldview of the Bible. And that can be wedges or bridges from a world that's falling apart, like Greece, like the late Middle Ages and Renaissance, like our own age, into the next world, books that can point to, the, again, as you say, avoiding cyclical, a cyclical view of history, the next step up, we've slipped, all right, wise man, the godly man falls seven times and rises again. So I would like us to talk about Books. And of course, no one here ever wants to talk about oh, books. Oh, no. Right? We hate no, talking no, no. about no, that's books. Not, that sounds so boring. I mean, it's not <laughs> what like... What do you think we are, nerds? <laughs> uh, Brian was mentioning uh, Rome and Greece, a collapse of, of classic civilization. And aside from the Bible, the great book that shifted people's thinking was Augustine's City of God. It was written in a time when Rome was still collapsing. And Augustine, first of all, had to answer the, the libelous charge, or libel written, yes, charge that this was all Christians' fault somehow. If, if they hadn't come along and seduced us away from our old gods, then things would be much better. And Augustine <laughs> has to say, you mean the gods of fallen Troy that had to be carried by hand to uh, found this new Rome of yours, those gods? Uh, but then he goes on beyond that and discusses the difference between fatalism on the one hand and luck contingency on the other hand and argues for the sovereignty of god in history and then he simply proceeds to say and here's the history of the world and, and he won't find things like linear history or philosophy of history in his writings he just tells us what happened and it was it was culture shattering and culture trans, transforming here we have a story a real history that begins a creation moves in a direction toward the toward the coming of Jesus, and then opens up from there to the ends of the earth until Jesus comes back and ends the story. We we And again, he didn't talk about plot, but now we have history with a plot, a beginning, a, a, a purpose, rising action, mysteries to be, to be solved, and then finally the, the revelation of God in Christ and the victory of the gospel. So that 
in time utterly transformed the West. And you mentioned also, I think, the Middle Ages. We can look here at, at Calvin's great work, Institutes of the Christian Religion. And from that book, we get England, the Scotch Presbyterians, the English Puritans, the Anglicans, the American Pilgrims and, and Puritans. We get the Republic of uh, the Netherlands, the Republic of South Africa, ultimately the United States in large measure. These, these were both culturally transforming books. And one question then becomes, one, have Christians written other books that have that same potential? Two, do they even think like that? And three, if you were stranded on a desert island or being rocketed by starship into a new world, what three books would you take with you? We will grandfather in the Bible so we <laughs> can all say that. Yes, we're going to take the Bible, obviously, we're Christians. Well, what else? So what are your thoughts, people? All right, let's go over the questions again. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot. I don't remember what I said. Um, so we uh, are, th are, there, are there books today that have been written along these lines? Do Christians look for such books? Do they read such books? And what books would, would you recommend to people who want to start thinking long term into the next several generations? So pick anything there that grabs your fancy. The Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. <laughs> I'm only half joking. In order to accomplish things, you need money. And in order to have money, you have to not spend it. You have to work, <laughs> and then you have to spend it or invest it wisely. And that's how you build something that you can really use. And if you're very wise with it, that generations after you can use. And I think Christians often want to be super spiritual and say, oh, you know, I'm not materialistic. I don't need a lot in life. But think what you could do if you used what you had in such a way as to get more so you can give more. I think that's a long-term thing. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's quite good. Uh, my econ class, the question used to be, what would you do with a million dollars? And the first time I asked that question, the kids' answers was, spend it all. <laughs> and we found they couldn't spend it all. They could, their imaginations were not big enough. They, could, they ran yeah. out of things to spend it on. When you get, you're getting down to buying chocolate bars and you still have $100,000 <laughs> left, you know, that's, you're, 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 there's a problem here. But as the years have gone by, more and more are getting the idea of, oh, investing would be good. But there are still those kids who say, but, but I want to give things to my church or to this or that missionary organization, which is, which is fine as far as it goes, particularly if they have pressing needs now. But I always scribble in a little note, but how much more could you give if you took that same money, invested it to produce a, common, uh, a constant stream of income over the next 20, 30, 40 years? You'd be, on, you'd be able to keep on giving. Mm -hmm. And that seems kind of a startling thought to some. I'm not sure that some of them even yet quite get what I'm saying. Paul, when he sums up, thou shalt not steal, says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands the thing that is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Paul says thou shalt not steal means, first of all, stop stealing in whatever <laughs> form. Two, work hard. Three, have it. Don't, the, 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 so that you, he may have to give. He's got to have it. He's got to not be spending it foolishly. But there is this, this practical charity, too. You have it. And one of the things you're going to do in having it is give it to the deserving poor, as Shaw will call them, people who actually need it, who cannot provide for themselves. So it would be nice if, if some Christian wrote some, and maybe someone has, and I'm just not coming up with it right now, or maybe some of the books that, that I know of just haven't received the credit they could do, but it would be nice if someone could write a culture-changing book along those lines. So I think I think you are certainly onto something. What else, Brian? You got one. What what book comes to your mind? Books that I would recommend bringing. It feels obligatory as well, but uh, definitely Lord of the Rings has got to be on the <laughs> list. And I have the one volume edition, Ooh, so nice. it counts as one. It only <laughs> counts as one. <laughs> to quote the movie Gimli. Them all. Yeah. Well, Tolkien meant it as one as well, so that's yeah, that is true. That's one book, yeah, so that's true. And because these are technically three different books, even though they're in a trilogy, I will limit myself to only that hideous strength mm. by C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis. 
And this is uh, my broken record sound from last week, but definitely Stephen Lawhead's Taliesin and any other of the books that I had time to grab as well. <laughs> I will take on the boat with me. And then one that I couldn't find on my shelf, but I know that I own uh, is one you mentioned earlier, City of God by St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me let me just pick one there. Sure. I grabbed most all people, of them. Most Christians know um, Lewis, and even if they haven't read that particular novel, they the name C.S. Lewis somehow sanctifies it. But uh, <laughs> people are more suspicious. Christians are more suspicious of Tolkien, especially once they find out he was Roman Catholic. <laughs> Why would you pick that book? Let's justify it to a listening world. I, I would be hard-pressed to think of another storybook that was written with such a care for internal consistency and theme mm -hmm. and the beauty mm -hmm. of the creation itself mm -hmm. and its redeemability than mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. I would say that the majority of Christian fiction that I've read has fallen prey to more than its own fair share of Gnosticism, wherein the villains of the piece are basically the worldly people. It's like a Jack Chick tracked made into a novel Ooh, again. I didn't know you would even know him. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Whereas, in the dark, uh, but that's okay. That's the, you you are lucky. IFB teetotaling gotcha. satanic panic of the 80s, etc. Uh -huh. But Tolkien. Well, you take two houseplants and you put them to the test. <laughs> no but but Tolkien to had an, <laughs> Tolkien just. In addition to the the strong cultural influences that he took and sanctifying them from mm -hmm. ancient Europe, for instance, the the Rohirrim are based heavily on the on the Saxons, and just Tolkien wrote a story wherein the universe is created out of a song, mm -hmm. and I songs are just words put to music, just. and we're talking about words, and we're talking <laughs> about books. It feels like Tolkien kind of understood something about creation and its inherent order and beauty that a lot of others in today's age especially don't. They look to creation and they don't see beauty and order. They see chaos. And Tolkien realized that any chaos is our own fault. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I that's can... why I would choose Tolkien. Go ahead. If I could just add to that. I love how in Tolkien's world, there's such a diversity of beauties that the elves have their beauty. The dwarves have their beauty. The men have their beauty and the hobbits have the best beauty of all. Um, <laughs> but it's sort of this permission. If we're talking about using this to build a civilization, this permission to be different, to mm -hmm. explore different ways of being beautiful. Absolutely. All right. Excellent. Thank you. And Emily, your choice is? Okay. I have. Well, this one is not by a Christian, but I think it's important in a day where individualism might be lost. That's Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. I have, that's the one of these three books that I've actually read. So these, <laughs> these other two <laughs> are caveated heavily. Um, but I figured, well, I didn't exactly figure that Brian would choose three fiction books, but I struggle to read more fiction always. I always just find myself reading biographies and self-help books because that's what's fun to me. Um, so I don't have any fiction here, which I recognize as a lack but my next book is The Great Tradition. This is like a retroactive doing this, what we're doing here with building civilizations. This is a collection of readings on the Western heritage, what has shaped the civilization that we have. So if I were to board a starship and have to carry something that tells me in addition to the Bible where we came from, this is a book that I would take. It's edited by Richard Gamble, who was my academic advisor in college, so that's special too. And then lastly, I have this book that no one has ever heard of except for the people who gave it to me. This is called A Pattern Language, about towns, buildings, and constructions. And it's about mm. making your ideas of beauty and community physical in buildings mm. and things. 
and I look forward to reading it, except that it's very long. <laughs> this is a problem because... <laughs> because I'm only halfway through the Gulag Archipelago, and mm -hmm. I don't want to read another long book. But, How about yeah. putting the Gulag on your list? Oh, that's true. I should replace 12 Rules for Life with that. I would, I would yeah. go for that yeah. myself, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I've only read half of it, and I've read all of 12 Rules for Life, and I feel like I should have read no, something that I recommend. <laughs> From my family, I get um, a number of other recommendations. Well, my daughter, Emily, who is a medievalist, recommends The Aeneid, <laughs> The Divine Comedy, and The Complete Works of Shakespeare in one volume. <laughs> uh, my youngest recommended all the technical guides you can think of <laughs> And, and, oh, rat, something else that was really, oh, and a good solid book on poetry. Mm. My wife, taking a very different tack, says, well, we could always pick all the books by the great dictators of history, <laughs> starting with Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, uh, Machiavelli, Castelloni, uh, Communist Manifesto, that would be an interesting <laughs> way of picking books, to be sure. My middle daughter wasn't home, so I'm not sure what oh. she would say, but she would go for most certainly fiction. Fiction. If that's your strong way. Maybe or, something or on theology, re maybe. resolving conflict among people, because we've got the prophet and the king, and we need some priestly recommendations here. Yeah, yeah. if she were if she were nearby, I would ask her. She's certainly my uh, my priestly character, and you're right. That's that is. That's what we need here. We need something for making life work, reconciling differences, problems with people, among people. I will be honest, I've thought this over again and again, and I keep coming up where you suggested. There are too many books, <laughs> and none of them seem to be exactly what we need for this hour. I'm still inclined to fall back on Calvin's Institutes, and even possibly on the City of God, the Westminster Confession, with its uh, various attachments. Uh, longer and shorter catechisms and such comes to mind. But to supplement, and its language at points is extremely beautiful. But for a, a greater depth of, of beauty, I would say the Book of Common Prayer mm -hmm. and a good solid psalter slash hymnal with singable tunes would be <laughs> yeah. very important because uh, the worship of the church will be at the heart of a Christian civilization. So we need to get that nailed down. But, yeah, we want to go beyond that, too, into describing ordinary life and, and what, it might, what it might look like. At some point, let's see if I have the year on this, in 2004, a gentleman, a British author and critic named Martin Seymour Smith, published a list of the most 100 influential books ever written. He doesn't mention City of God, but he does mention the Institutes. But the interesting thing, I think for our purposes, is that after Calvin and Luther, the only explicit Christian book that he puts on the list is Pilgrim's Progress, mm -hmm. which is a devotional manual written in allegorical terms about a man who apparently abandoned his family, never had a job. You know, so <laughs> and it, it would be easy to say, well, he's a secularist and he's not giving Christians their due. But I think at that point, we need to step back and say, where exactly is he sliding us? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can look at, I, I mentioned the, the Communist Manifesto. There's a book that changed the world. Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant, uh, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. There are a host of books that have altered the world's culture and very few of them were written by Christians. And is that, shall we chalk that one up too, to the to God's predestination? God just hasn't predestinated that any of us to be good authors, just as he hasn't predestinated, <laughs> he's going to save very many people. Or may that be a lack in our vision and understanding of creation? And maybe should we be working at reading more, reading deeper, and reading longer, and, and then maybe at some point actually writing something of substance rather than with an eye to just the next four or five years? One, one thing I would also suggest is taking an idea from a little bit later in the scriptures in Exodus, we should not be afraid to, quote, plunder the Egyptians mm -hmm. because yeah. they, for the unbelieving line, mastered metallurgy, as you've yes. so succinctly pointed out at the beginning of this, this episode. 
we shouldn't conclude from that that metallurgy is now satanic. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I, I specifically mentioned at the start of this that if you were going to be starting a civilization, you should consider bringing along the basics of blacksmithing. Mm -hmm. yeah, blacksmithing absolutely. is not evil because the line of Cain figured it out first. Or because it has the word black in it. Oh, no. <laughs> we are we are part of the kingdom of light. Black is dark. Darkness is, is Satan's realm, right? Hey, we have had families. <laughs> we've had families. Families question our use of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in our curriculum because of the word witch. Mm -hmm. Not so much because there's a witch in the story, because we explain, no, she's the bad guy. But because, but no, it says witch, and we our children shouldn't be reading a book that says witch. But it's not so far removed from, from other American-rooted Christians who look at things and say, well, there, there's magic there. There's dragons there. There's elves there. They they referenced wine. Yeah, yeah. To be sure, there there was wine here. Uh, uh, that that guy smoked a a pipe. That's that's tobacco. And, and <laughs> this film is now rated R because people smoke in it. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. and unfortunately, I mean, we can mock that, but there are people who are Christian, and we need to be gentle with them as best we mm -hmm. can. But we can't let that set the standard for. As you say, plundering, spoiling the Egyptians and finding the things that do reflect the basic dominion mandate, the dominion tribe that God has placed in all people. When, when the children of Israel came into the promised land, they were told there are some things you must not touch. You must, you must destroy them, burn them, grind them to pieces. These were idols and religious artifacts. But the houses, the vineyards, the wells, use them. Uh, the Bible itself, when you think of all of Paul's uh, writings in Christian liberty and meets offered to idols, some things that come out of a pagan culture bring their paganism with them, but not everything. And even the idols, when they're melted down, that gold was to adorn the temple of God. The gold itself was, you know, after being refined, but the gold itself was not tainted by its former purpose. Well, it did, I, 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 let me question that if i remember correctly if it came directly from idols they were to get rid of it but if it was simply something the egyptians had then absolutely the gold that uh, built the golden calf was from the earrings mm -hmm. that was symbols of their subjection in each i mean here here is a mark of you were slaves to the empire okay well let's take it in oh wait we made a golden calf what they should have done is exactly what you said and later they would they would take the rest of their their plunder and spoil and turn it into the tabernacle. And there are Christians today, I think, who would be horrified at that. But that, that, that was from pagans. And you don't know where it's been. And you don't know what it's touched. And Paul's answer is, and don't ask. <laughs> yeah. Just just to use it. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. If it's not carrying its idolatrous qualifications on its surface, then then yeah, it's 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 usable. Melt it down and, and do something productive with it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, and therefore, as Christians, we have to be particularly careful in the areas of, of worship, liturgy, and of theology, and, and in a broader sense of philosophy. But definite integrals and um, laws of Newtonian mechanics, I mean, even here, there, there, there's a danger, but the formulas work. The, 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 the nice atheist grandma next door who makes the best apple, apple crisp in the world, you can use her recipe. It's not tainted by her atheism. <laughs> Let's let's get something that she's come up with and bless God's people with it. Mm -hmm. But the problem, of course, is all of this takes work, especially when it comes to books, because you got to read them and you got to process them. And you have to have the theological mindset to know what you're looking for. I have taken a lot of flack from one particular individual with regard to the books I require of my seniors, juniors and seniors. And we don't we don't introduce these books at the, at the lower grades to any great extent. But when you get to World Lit... We do Epic of Gilgamesh, Enuma Elish, the Iliad, the Aeneid, and then uh, you get into the Middle Ages, we have Dante, and we have uh, the Norse mythologies, and I have been accused of polluting the minds of my students by having them read these things. Did they prepare hemlock for you to drink? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Corrupting the minds of the youth and teaching, anyway. <laughs> Uh, and my response traditionally has been one of two things. First of all, we don't introduce these things until they've had 11 years of Bible, mm -hmm. of biblical theology and systematics, and of actually reading the text of Scripture and getting it in their minds and hearts and memories. 
And secondly, I would rather have them read these things with me because they're about to go to college where they most certainly will be introduced to these things. Mm -hmm. And they better have read them from a Christian perspective first or the enemy can play all kinds of havoc with their, um, with their minds in these things. Paul knew and quoted the Stoic poets without apology, but he didn't let them determine his theology. Mm -hmm. And the, the warning, of course, is always be careful be very careful. <laughs> We're not as smart or as sanctified as we think we are. Yeah. And there's only one book that isn't, well, even the Bible was written by sinners, but it's inspired, so it gets a pass. But <laughs> every other yeah. book in the world is written by a sinner, whether it's Christian or secular. Mm. It it's just kind of comes with reading the job of discernment. And it's it's worth just reminding myself and you three and all of our listeners. One of one of the weaknesses I see in in the Reformed Church is that we often forget that the Holy Spirit is active in us now, uh, and that's partially an overreaction. I, I see it in myself a lot because I I came out of Pentecostalism, so it's kind of like, oh, you're talking about the Spirit? No, you. Uh, wait, <laughs> no, wait, he's God. I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> And we need to fight against that because he is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Son. But God the Holy Spirit is in every believer mm -hmm. and is there to provide us discernment. We should pray and ask for it. Mm -hmm. It's not a turn your mind off and let the Spirit do the discerning for you. It's, Lord, I humbly ask that you come alongside me and support me in this and give me the undergirding discernment to know what is right and wrong and to find the good things in this. Mm -hmm. James says God will give wisdom to him who asks for it sincerely. Mm. And the wisdom itself is predicated upon how much of the Bible we've actually read because mm -hmm. on, on the one hand as a response against your, your former Pentecostalism, God does not just poof in new knowledge out of nowhere, but he will quicken and make use of whatever we've committed ourselves to learning and submitted to. Mm -hmm. So we want more wisdom. Yes, we ask, but we also read the Bible mm -hmm. more. And, and, and in the midst of all this, one of the weaknesses that, that I find oftentimes by no means universal in the Reformed community is we don't know our Bibles well enough. Mm -hmm. we, we, we can't go back and forth, and not as a matter of Bible trivia, but simply as a book we've read so many times that, of course, we recognize what to others are obscure references or quotations <laughs> or allusions. Because it's the it's the language and the thought patterns we live and breathe. So as we as we close out talking about books, let's remind everybody to go back to the Bible, as Schaefer would say in his in old uh, classic children's hymn set. Back to the Bible, back to the Word of God. Uh, Schaefer, we left him out of our recommendations. Oh, I God. almost grabbed the God who was there. Oh. Ah, dang it! Yeah. How should we then live? Well, ben, That's relevant. You know, or Doctor Van Til. Yeah. There are a lot of people we could have added, and if some some we add because we just don't want to stir up a hornet's nest right now. But what about when he said this? This and this. All right, yeah, we yeah, yeah we got that. Speaking of stirring up hornet's nests, uh, <laughs> I I know I don't like him, but and I know that a lot of others don't. But one of my absolute favorite quotes is somebody came to Carl Bart and asked him, mm -hmm. Professor Bart, what is the most profound truth? from from the scripture what 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 would you share what is this deep truth and he goes jesus loves me this i know for the bible tells me so yeah well to counterbalance that when dr van till was asked by a, a hollywood actor who was himself a christian john uh, quaid dr van till why do you say all of these incredibly profound things and van till looked at him and said because the bible tells me so Mm -hmm. Same Bible, what Barth got out of it and what Dr. Van Til got out of it were probably <laughs> not remotely the same thing. I think they had a conversation but, or two about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, once or twice. We're talking about the the Bible read in the context of the theology of the Church Catholic, not stuff made up in the moment of existential crisis. The real Bible, the Bible where God speaks to us in the power of the Spirit, but he also speaks to everyone, every other believer, so that what we get is a covenantal communal message that is objectively true and that we can verify by appeal both to Scripture and to the writings and lives of those who've laid down their life for the faith. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> and that seems like a good place to stop. It does. I think we'll we'll skip recommendations unless you have something that's not a book to add. I do have a not a book recommendation, and right. I'm glad that I didn't give it last week. <laughs> <laughs> One, I would recommend this movie. Just check the parents' guide. I think there's some strong mm. language in it. But Jojo Rabbit, directed by Taika Waititi, mm, I've heard uh, good things. is actually a fantastic movie. I saw it on the advice of a friend who had gone to see it, and it is brilliant and hilarious and heartbreaking and all of the emotions at once, basically. <laughs> it, it kind of, mm. like any movie that is a comedy set during World War II, it can kind of flip-flop on you really quick. <laughs> so there's there's multiple moments like that and absurd juxtapositions of ideas next to each other that kind of point out the absurdity of things like Nazism. So mm. recommend. It's very good. And that is my reco for the week. Cool. I'm going to recommend the houseplant song by Audio Adrenaline, which is what I was referencing earlier that Greg was unhappily not privy to. It's <laughs> a lighthearted recommendation, but it does deal with these themes that we've been talking about, about, the evils of rock and roll, etc. <laughs> so thank you so much for this conversation. It's been so fun. And it's always a treat to know what's on your bookshelves. <laughs> that was a pleasure to be here for it. Yeah, fun as always. Thanks to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our listeners and supporters. We really appreciate you. We couldn't do this without you. Share us in person or on social media. We have a Facebook page. You can like it. Uh, you can leave us a review on iTunes. Send us an email at Halting Towards Zion. And check out our show notes and transcripts for any links to things that we have mentioned. Thanks. See you next time. Mm-hmm.